from Pacifica, this is Democracy Now! Fleecy locks and black complexion cannot forfeit nature's claim. Skin may differ, but affection dwells in black and white the same. And were I so tall as to reach the pole or to grasp the ocean at a span, I must be measured by my soul. The mind is the standard of the man. In a Democracy Now! and Pacifica Radio Archives exclusive, we air a newly discovered recording of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. It was December 1964, days before he received the Nobel Peace Prize in Oslo, Dr. King gave a major address in London on segregation, the fight for civil rights, and his support for Nelson Mandela and the anti-apartheid struggle in South Africa. If the United Kingdom and the United States decided tomorrow morning not to buy South African goods, not to buy South African gold, if our investors and capitalists would withdraw their support for the racial tyranny that we find there, then apartheid would be brought to an end. Today, Dr. King's City Temple Address, December 7th, 1964, in London. All that and more, coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I am Amy Goodman. Today is the federal holiday honoring Dr. Martin Luther King. He was born January 15, 1929. He was assassinated April 4, 1968, at the Lorraine Motel in Memphis, Tennessee. He was just 39 years old. While Dr. King is primarily remembered as a civil rights leader, he also championed the cause of the poor, organizing the Poor People's Campaign to address issues of economic justice. Dr. King was also a fierce critic of U.S. foreign policy in the Vietnam War. In 1964, Dr. King became the youngest recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize. Days before he received that award in Oslo, Norway, Dr. King traveled to London. On December 7, 1964, Dr. King gave a speech sponsored by the British group Christian Action about the civil rights struggle in the United States, as well as the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa. The speech was recorded by Saul Bernstein, who was working as the European correspondent for Pacifica Radio. Bernstein's recording was recently discovered by Brian DeShazer, director of the Pacifica Radio Archives. This is that address by Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. I want to talk with you mainly about our struggle in the United States and before taking my seat, talk about some of the larger struggles in the whole world and some of the more difficult struggles in places like South Africa. But that is a desperate, poignant question on the lips of people all over our country and all over the world. I get it almost. Everywhere I go and almost every press conference, it is a question of whether we are making any real progress in the struggle to make racial justice a reality in the United States of America. And whenever I seek to answer that question, on the one hand, I seek to avoid and undo pessimism. On the other hand, I seek to avoid a superficial optimism. And I try to incorporate or develop what I consider a realistic position by admitting on the one hand that we have made many significant strides over the last few years in the struggle for racial justice. But by admitting that before the problem is solved, we still have numerous things to do and many challenges to meet. And it is this realistic position that I would like to use as a basis for our thinking together tonight as we think about the problem in the United States. We have come a long, long way 
But we have a long, long way to go before the problem is solved. Now let us notice first that we've come a long, long way, and I would like to say at this point that the Negro himself has come a long, long way in re-evaluating his own intrinsic worth. Now, in order to illustrate this, a little history is necessary. It was in the year 1619 when the first Negro slaves landed on the shores of America. And they were brought there from the soils of Africa. Unlike the Pilgrim Fathers who landed at Plymouth a year later, they were brought there to gain their wills. And throughout slavery, the Negro was treated in a very inhuman fashion. He was a thing to be used, not a person to be respected. The United States Supreme Court rendered a decision in 1857 known as the Dred Scott decision, which well illustrated what existed at that time. But in this decision, the Supreme Court of the United States said in substance that the Negro is not a citizen of the United States. He is merely property subject to the dictates of his owner. And it went on to say that the Negro has no rights that the white man is bound to respect. And this was the idea that prevailed during the days of slavery. With the growth of slavery, it became necessary to give some justification for it. You know, it seems to be a fact of life that human beings cannot continue to do wrong without eventually reaching out for some thin rationalization to clothe an obvious wrong in the beautiful garments of righteousness. And this is exactly what happened during the days of slavery. There were those who even misused the Bible and religion to give some justification for slavery and to crystallize the patterns of the status quo. And so it was argued from some pulpits that the Negro was inferior by nature because of Noah's curse upon the children of Ham. And then the Apostle Paul's dictum became a watchword, servants be obedient to your master. And one brother had probably read the logic of the great philosopher Aristotle. You know, Aristotle did a great deal to bring into being what we now know as formal logic in philosophy. An informal logic that is a big word known as the syllogism, which has a major premise, a minor premise, and a conclusion. And so this brother decided to put his argument for the inferiority of the Negro in the framework of an Aristotelian syllogism. He could say all men are made in the image of God. This was a major premise. Then came the minor premise. God, as everybody knows, is not a Negro. Therefore, the Negro is not a man. This was the kind of reasoning uh, that prevailed. Well, living with the conditions of slavery and then later segregation, many Negroes lost faith in themselves. Many came to feel that perhaps they were less than human. Many came to feel that they were inferior. This, it seems to me, is the greatest tragedy of slavery, the greatest tragedy of segregation, not merely what it does to the individual physically, but what it does to one psychologically. It scars the soul of the segregated as well as the segregator. It gives the segregator a false sense of superiority while leaving the segregated with a false sense of inferiority. And this is exactly what happened. But then something happened to the Negro, and circumstances made it possible and necessary for him to travel more. The coming of the automobile, the upheavals of two world wars, the Great Depression. And so his rural plantation background gradually gave way to urban industrial life. 
His economic life was gradually rising through the growth of industry, the development of organized labor and expanded educational opportunities. And even his cultural life was gradually rising through the steady decline of crippling illiteracy. And all of these forces conjoined to cause the Negro in America to take a new look at himself. Negro masses all over began to reevaluate themselves. And then something else happened along with all of this. The Negro in the United States turned his eyes and his mind to Africa. And he noticed the magnificent drama of independence taking place on the stage of African history.